Welcome to another broadcast from Evangel Worship Center in Mariana, Florida. Our service times are Sundays at 9.30 a.m., Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m., and our office is open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. For more information about our church, visit our website at evangelonline.net or call 850-526-2232. Save my soul, my soul, and this fire. 
So why would we have a communion cup as the center of live dead? What, what, what is the representation? Why have communion as the center of who we are? Years ago when I was in India, I heard about a pastor. And sometimes you hear stories that are so fantastic, it just seems too good to be true. How many of you ever heard a too good to be true story? <laughs> and this one seems so too good to be true, I had to go and verify it for myself. So I got in my vehicle and I drove up in the mountains and this pastor lived far up in the hills. And I walked up to his house and he lived in a little bamboo thatch house up in the mountains. And I drove up and walked the rest of the way and I sat down with him and I asked him, I said, Pastor, please tell me your story. I I've heard your story is so fantastic. And he told me that when he was 60 years old, when I was with him, he was in his late 70s. So this had been some 17, 18 years earlier. He said, when I was 60 years old, I had been paralyzed for almost six years. Could not move a muscle from the neck down. He said, I went to doctors, I, I was taken to priests, and I had everything. People tried everything to bring healing, and there was, there was no hope. And finally, the doctors gave up. The, the priest said, you know, maybe this is just God's will for your life, and, and they gave up. He said, there was no hope for me. He said, and one day, I fell asleep, and in the night, I had a dream. And in my dream, it took me back to a time when I was a small boy. And he said, I could vividly see in my dream, walking down the road with my mother. She was holding my hand. We're walking through the town. And as we're walking along, there was a man I saw standing on a box. He had a big white beard. He was holding a black book. And he was telling stories about a God who could heal people. He said, when I woke up from the dream, he said, that's all I could remember. There's a book somewhere with stories about a God who could heal people. So he said, I went to my daughter, my, I called my daughter into the room, and I said, please, I need you to go into the town, search through the town, find me one of those books with stories about the God who healed people. So his daughter walks to the town. She starts walking all through the town and asking people, have you ever heard of a black book with stories about a God who heals people? And as she walked around the town, nobody had heard of it, but everybody kept saying, it sounds like a wonderful book. If you find one, bring me one too. I'd love to have it. <laughs> and finally, one day, after two days of walking through this little town, there was only one small little church in the town, and she finally, one day, came across a man who happened to be a believer, and she asked him, have you ever heard of a black book with stories about a man who heals people? And the man said, yes. I've heard of the book, we call it the Bible, and the God, his name is Jesus, and he still heals people today. And he took her to the little church where he was and took him to meet her pastor, his pastor. And, uh, and the pastor shared with her after a couple of days spending together sharing the word with her. Finally, she decided, she said, uh, okay, I'm going to go back and please give me one of these books. So they gave her a little New Testament, said, take this back to your father. We're going to be praying with you that God's going to heal your father. So she takes off running back to her village. It took her over a day to get back, but finally she comes back into the village early one morning and she uh, walks into her father's room and she said, Father, I found one. I found the book and I found the God. They say his name is Jesus and they say he still heals people today. And his father, he said he was just told me he was just laying on his side on a pillow and uh, he asked her, he said, would you please take the book and just put it on my head? And so they put the book on the side of his head, the Bible, and they prayed, Jesus, would you heal my father? And he said, as soon as my daughter said that prayer and the Bible touched my head, he said, I felt my fingers just start to pop. And then in a minute, my toes started popping. He said, within a, about 30 minutes, I was able to sit up on my bed. And finally, I was, I, as I stood up and sat up, I picked the Bible up and I started to read it. He said, I didn't stop reading until I'd read it from cover to cover. It took me all through the night. I read through it, and when I finished reading it, I decided, okay, let's, let's see if it really worked. And he said, and I was able to stand up. I walked out of my house. I knelt down, and I gave my heart to Jesus. He said he called his entire family together and said, come, you've got to hear about the God who healed me. And he told them the story of Jesus, and his entire family got saved. Now, he was a very blessed man. He was, by the time he was 60, he had 20 children, had over 100 grandchildren. So his first service, I mean, it was, it was over 120 people at the first service. <laughs> 
The entire village, everyone there, his whole family got saved. And he decided, I don't know how to teach my family. And so, so the first thing he did with the legs that God had given him, he walked to the town where the little church was, found the pastor, and told him, I need you to train me so I can teach my family. And they sent him to Bible school. So when he was 60 years old, he went to Bible school. He graduated when he was 63 and came back and started pastoring the little church. And from that time, he started going from village to village. And by the time I was with him, now he's in his late 70s, he had pastored, uh, planted dozens and dozens of churches all over the hills throughout those mountains. And I'm sitting with him now, and he's getting old, and we're sitting in front of his little house, and, uh, and I'm just amazed at this story. And as we're sitting there, his wife brought out some tapioca roots for us. They had been boiled, and she brought out some herbal tea, and she sat the tea in front of us. And I'm just, I'm just stunned hearing the stories of this wonderful man of God. And as we're sitting there, he picked up one of those tapioca roots. It's getting dark outside, and he started looking out across the valley. And as it got dark, people start to light the fires in the village, so you can start to see where the villages are. And he points over and says, you see over there where that village? He said, that's the first village I went to when I came back, and uh, my son pastors the church there now. You see this village over here? Everyone in that village today is a good. The entire village follows Jesus today, and he's pointing all over this valley at places where he had walked to and planted the church. Finally, he got very serious, and he took that root with both hands. And he said, you know, last week, he said, Buddhist monks from uh, villages far to the north, and he pointed beyond these mountains. We're on the side of a hill, and there's another hill beyond us. And he said, beyond those mountains, Buddhist priests from that village heard about my story, and they walked all the way. It took them weeks to walk here. And they came, and they asked me to tell my story, and I told them my story. He said, when I finished, they begged me. They said, would you please come to our villages? Our, our people need to hear this story. Our people need to hear about this Jesus. Would you please come to us? Would you please tell us about Jesus? And he took that root and he looked me in the eye and said, I'm old. I'm weak. I don't know if I can make it. But if God will give me strength before I die, I will go there. And I will preach the gospel. And when he said that, he broke that root. And he handed me half of the root. And I had one of the greatest moments of revelation I've ever had in my life. You remember on the Emmaus Road when Jesus was walking along with two disciples. He said they're walking along and they didn't even know it was Jesus. And then finally they came to a house and it was when Jesus broke the bread that their eyes were open. And they understood, oh wow, that's Jesus. I felt like that kind of moment. Here's what Paul tells us about communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Everybody say remembrance. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Everybody say it again, remembrance. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28, let a person examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I realized at that moment that that's what communion was meant to be. You know, we've taken communion and we've personalized it to be all about me. It's just about me and Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. And I can drink, I can eat, rejoice. Thank you, Jesus, you died for me. But what Pastor Sherpa, my friend in the hills, was pointing out to me that communion was not just a time to remember that Jesus died for me. It was time to remember that Jesus died for every man, for every woman, for every tribe, for every tongue, for every nation. Jesus died for all people. And when we break bread together, it is a time to remember that Jesus died so that all people might be saved. 
If you look in the Old Testament, you will find that all covenants were made with the breaking of bread. Whenever God made a covenant with one of the patriarchs, he always made a covenant by them breaking bread together. You see, on the night before Jesus died, he wasn't simply asking the apostles to remember, I'm going to die for you. He was asking them to remember his purpose of why I'm dying. I'm dying so that all people might be saved. I'm dying so that people from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue might be saved. That's why Jesus died. When he was breaking bread for them, here's basically what he was saying to them. Tonight, I'm going to give my body. My body is going to be broken to bring help to bring healing, to bring hope to all the peoples of the earth. When he passed the bread, the question was, will you join me? Will you give your body to take this message to the ends of the earth? Will you give your body to make sure that all people have the chance that you have to know me? So that all people have the chance that you have had to walk with me. That all people have the chance that you have had to commune with me. He was asking them, will you join me? When he gave the cup, he was saying to them, my blood is going to be shed. I am going to give my life to bring salvation to all people in all the earth. What Jesus was asking them is, will you join me? Will you give your life to take this message to the ends of the earth? And what we know according to Scripture, we know that the first apostles, we know they understood this because every one of them lived true to this message. Of the eleven that broke bread with Jesus that night, we know Judas went off to betray him, but of the eleven who broke bread with Jesus that night, ten of them died martyrs' deaths. Only John lived to an old age, but most of his life was spent in exile on, an, on a rock called Patmos. The other ten, only James died in his own home. He died in Jerusalem. The other nine apostles all died in lands that were not their own. Some of them died in Africa. Some of them died in Europe. Some of them died across the Silk Road in Iran and preaching the gospel throughout the world. They lived true to a covenant that Jesus, you gave your body, you gave your blood to give us salvation. And we will remember you. We will give our bodies. We will give our life to make sure everyone has a chance to know that you are the hope, the Savior of the world. That day, my friend in India was asking me, I'm old. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can do it alone. But will you join me? Will you join me in this journey? Will you go with me to these hills? Will you give your body? Will you give your life to make sure that the people of those villages know about Jesus? That's what Jesus asked every one of us every time we break bread together. It is a renewal of a covenant to remember not only did Jesus die for me, but Jesus died for all people. That's what Jesus is calling us to. He's not just encouraging us to remember his death for us. You remember in Matthew chapter 28, some of the last words that Jesus spoke, what did he say? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. In Mark, he repeats the same thing. Go and make disciples of all people. The very last thing he said before he ascended in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. Over and over and over, Jesus was encouraging them to remember why he died. To remember the purpose of life. That life is not to be lived to see how much we can attain, to see how much we can have. Life is to be lived to the glory of God who gave his life that all men might be saved. There was an early movement called the Moravians. They were the original missionary movement. 
And the original Moravian missionary movement started when a group of people started praying together. And they called it the 100-year prayer meeting. That in one place, in a place called Hernhut in Germany, for 100 years without a break, people were praying for the lost to know Jesus. For 100 years. Started back in the 1800s. And as they started praying, they started realizing praying about it is not enough. We've got to do something about it. And one day as they were praying, two young men, they had been been reading the headlines. and, And one of the headlines they had seen in the newspaper of the day was about an island in the Caribbean where no one had ever preached the gospel, that there were no churches there. And those two men decided, we think the Lord is calling us to go to that place. So they went and tried to get passage to that island. But the governor of that island was an atheist. And he had declared, I will never allow a preacher on this island. I will never allow anyone to come and preach on this island. As long as I live, there will never be a church on this island. They couldn't get passage to the island. But during that day, the the horrible slave trade was going on. And they found that the only way we can get to this island is there's slave ships going to the island. So literally their dedication was so great that they decided we will go down to the market and we will sell ourselves into slavery so that we can get to the island. That's dedication. And they went down to the slave markets and allowed themselves to be sold off and they were put in chains on a boat to go to the island. People from the Moravian mission heard about it and they all came to the boat as they were leaving and they were all weeping. What have these guys done? They're throwing their lives away. And one of them said something that became a a theme for the Moravians. As everyone was standing crying, he was on the deck in chains. And he shouted out, May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his sacrifice. May the lamb who was slain Receive the reward of his sacrifice. Why did Jesus die? His reward is not my getting rich. His reward is not seeing how healthy he can make me. His reward is the souls of all men. His reward is the Sudanese and the Somali. His reward is the Saudi and the people of Qatar. His reward is the Indian and the Chinese. His reward is the people of all the world for whom he died. That's why Jesus died. And every one of us must remember every day that Jesus died for all people and the task is not done. There are still so many who have never heard his name. In the world today, 11,236 people groups in the world today. A people group is simply defined as a group of people who distinguish themselves by their language, by their ethnicity, by their culture, by by their geography of where they live. Distinct groups of people, 11,236 distinct groups of people. Of those people groups, 6,000 536 remain unreached today. 6,536. That means over half of all of the people groups in the world today remain in a state of being unreached by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means that among them there would only be a handful of Christians, not enough people to be able to evangelize and, and reach out among themselves. 2,000 years after Jesus died. Why? Because we don't remember. We don't remember why Jesus died. We don't remember that he died for all people. There's another category that is almost mind-boggling to me. 3,050. That is over one quarter of all of the people groups in the world are in a category that is considered unengaged. That means that 
2,000 years after Jesus died, among 3,050 people groups around the world today, they have never heard the name of Jesus. There is no church. There's no pastor. There's no missionary. There's not one follower of Jesus among them. For one quarter of humanity, they live in a darkness where there is no light. You know, sometimes people question the why of missions. Why, why do we do missions? We have lost people right here. I have family members who don't know Jesus. I have neighbors who don't know Jesus. How can I go around the world or why should I go around the world when there's so many lost right here? And I have one word response to that, and that is access. Everybody say with me, access. You know, the one difference between the lost of Mariana, Florida, and the lost of Sudan, and the lost of Somalia, and the lost of the hills of India comes down to one simple thing, and it's called access. You know, this morning I woke up, and I cut the TV on, and the very first thing that came at me was a smiling face <laughs> saying, Jesus loves you. <laughs> you know what that's called? Access. Everybody say access. That means that even without intent, even without searching for him, I could just wake up and cut the TV on and even by accident, I can hear the gospel today living in Mariana, Florida. How many of you know that's a good thing? I got in my car today and on the way here, I listened to Christmas carols the whole way to church this morning. I could have flipped to another channel and found worship. I could have found people preaching that even by accident today, just getting into my car and cutting on the radio, I could have heard the gospel message today. It's called access. It's a good thing. On my way to this church, I came from the highway. On my way to this church, I crossed over a dozen other churches to get to this church. Let me tell you, that's a good thing. Because everybody's different and God knows we're different. And in every one of those churches, there's different styles, different kind of singing, different kind of preaching, different kind of presentations. Praise the Lord. That's called access. On my way to church, I saw signs on billboards. If you grew up in Jackson County, you, you can't go to a grocery store, you can't go to work, you can't go somewhere without having some kind of contact with somebody who knows Jesus. How many of you know that's true? Let me tell you, we have lost here, and we need to do everything we can do to reach the lost here. But the lost of Jackson County, the lost of Mariana, are not the same as the lost of Afghanistan. They don't have access. And it's our responsibility as the people of God to remember those who have no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus called us and he asked us to take the bread with him in remembrance of those who have no access. To take the cup with him in remembrance of those who have no access. Who've never had the chance to know the God who changed our lives. In India alone, there are 2,000 and 33 unreached people groups just in India. Over 2,000 unreached people groups in India alone. Let me tell you, the task is great. Some of you may not know the story of how the church was started in India. Back in A.D. 52, I imagine in my mind there was a communion going on. And the apostles were sitting around because the Bible tells us daily they broke bread together. And I can see them every day that they broke bread together. They began to talk about what was left to be done. And as they took the bread in their hands, they would remember together. You know, I, I've heard about a nation to our, to our west in a place called Africa, a place called Egypt. Nobody's gone yet. Who will go? And one of the apostles took the bread and said, I will go. I will give my body. He took the cup and drank it and said, I will go. I will give my life. And history tells us that one of the apostles went into Africa and began to preach the gospel. And there's still churches in Africa and in, in Egypt today. They went down into Ethiopia. There's still churches in Ethiopia today. And at least two apostles died martyrs' deaths in Africa preaching the gospel. 
I could see some of them sitting around one day breaking bread together and saying, you know, we've heard in the Roman Empire over in Europe that, uh, that they haven't heard yet who will go. And I could see the Apostle Paul taking the bread and saying, I will go. I will take my, give my body. I will give my life. I will go. And he went there and preached the gospel. And Paul and Peter and a number of the apostles gave their lives as martyrs in Europe preaching the gospel. And that's why many of you are here today. But one of them, on one day, they must have been sitting around and talking, and there were some ships that had come from overseas, and they had spices, and they had silks, and they began to talk about, where is all this from? And they said, oh, it's from a place called India. It's uh, one of the largest populations of people we've ever seen, and, and they all worship idols, and they've never heard. And, and I could see the Apostle Thomas sitting around and saying, you know, somebody's got to do it. I give my body. I give my life. I will go. And history tells us that in A.D. 52, the Apostle Thomas got on a boat, went all the way to India, preached the gospel in India in the state of modern day Kerala and left churches behind that today they still call themselves Martoma Christians to this day. They trace their lineage back to the preaching of the Apostle Thomas. The most Christianized state in India, over 30% of the population to this day are followers of Jesus. From there, he went to the modern city of Chennai and preached the gospel. He was preaching up on the top of a hill that today is known as Thomas Mount. And preaching on top of that hill, Hindu priests took him and took spears and killed him on top of that mountain. And if you go to that mountain today, you can look out over the city at New Life Assembly of God, a church that today, as we're sitting here and worshiping today, over 50,000 people every Sunday gather together and worship because of a man who remembered Jesus. You see, when you remember Jesus, people live. When you forget about Jesus... People die. How many of you know it's easy to forget? Man, life has a way of just getting us. I, I shouldn't be able to forget. When I was 20 years old, I was an alcoholic. My life was broken, shattered. I had no hope. I had no joy. I had no life. I thought everything was going to end. 20 years old, and I was already at the end. But when I was 20 years old, Jesus Christ found me. He found me riding home from a bar in a truck one night. And Jesus Christ came to me. And he changed my life. And everything I have today is because of Jesus. I came from a broken home. And now I have a wife and three wonderful sons who love the Lord. I came from being a plumber. I wasn't a pastor nor the son of a pastor. I was a plumber, and I was the son of a plumber. And God found me and sent me around the world to preach the gospel. I shouldn't be able to forget. When I first found Jesus, my only desire was to serve him. People have always asked me, how did you know Jesus called you to preach? How did you know Jesus called you to India? And I have to be honest, I didn't. When I was in church, I'd only been saved a couple of months, and I was just so excited about Jesus. And my pastor said to me, you should go to Bible school. And I said, all right, I'll go to Bible school. So I went to Bible school. When I was in Bible school, I had a teacher there who was a former missionary to India. And she used to tell me stories about India. And listening to those stories, it felt like my head was just swimming with desire. And finally, one day after class, I went up to her and said, Do you think I could go to India? Can you help me get a ticket? I, I, somebody needs to go, and it might as well be me. I didn't go to India because I thought God was calling me to India. I just volunteered. I just thought somebody needs to do it, and it might as well be me. How many of you know volunteers fight a lot better than draftees? <laughs> you know, draftees just sit around praying their numbers never called. <laughs> and let me tell you, the church is filled with draftees. <laughs> I, I don't even understand the mentality of a people who start conversations with God with the words, please don't. <laughs> God, please 
don't send me to India. God, please don't send me to Africa. God, please don't make me go to China. God, please don't make me preach. Don't make me sing. Don't make me serve. God, please don't make me talk. Man, you should come on your knees before the Lord every day. And just say, Lord, you've been so good to me. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm, I want to volunteer. Is there anywhere I could go? Is there anything I could do? Is there anything I could say? I just want to be used by you. God, is there anything I can do for you? That's what happens when you remember what Jesus did for you. When you remember what Jesus did for you, all you want to do is volunteer. But when you forget... When you start thinking about bills that have to be paid and problems in the family and stuff going on, all of a sudden life starts to change. Man, remembrance took me all the way to India, took me all the way to Laos. And along that journey, we saw hundreds of churches planted. We've seen tens of thousands of people come to faith. Seen Bible schools build and, and seen lives changed. I mean, remembering Jesus, people live. But man, every once in a while, life gets in, and you want to forget. Eleven years back, our uh, youngest son was born with one kidney. And when he was born, we were getting ready to move into a very remote area of the hills. And the doctors at that point said, you know, that's probably not a good place to take him. There's no hospitals there. And if, some, if there's a problem, he's going to be in bad shape. And, uh, and in that area we were coming from, my wife and son had just been diagnosed with tuberculosis. And, uh, and they had had some other, you know, some, a lot of uh, bacterial amoebic diseases. And the doctor said, you know, that's, that's not a good place to take a child who already only has one kidney. That's probably not a good place. And the more we thought about ourselves, the less... We remember Jesus. See, the more you think about you, the less you're going to think about Jesus. And the more I put my stuff at the center of life, the more I focused on me. And the more I focused on me, the less I remember Jesus. And I started making plans based on remembering myself, remembering my family. And we were almost to a place of, well, well maybe, maybe we can't go back. Maybe we can't do it. And we had to come back to the table. And we had to break bread again. We had to take the cup again and say, Jesus, you gave everything so that we could have life. You gave your body. You gave your blood so that we could have life. Jesus, who are we to withhold anything from you? We come to you again. We break the bread again and we say we give you our bodies. We take the cup again and we say we give you our life. Whatever it takes, we will follow after you. We chose to remember Jesus. And we went with our young son up into that area. Remembering Jesus. And what we found is this, man, when you remember Jesus, people live. When you remember Jesus, people live. In that area today, we went up into that a group of people that they would have been on the list of unreached people. They would have been on the list of people who didn't have a church. They would have been on the list of people who didn't have a pastor. They were the unengaged, the unreached. But because we remember Jesus in that area today, there are over a dozen Buddhist priests who have come to faith. We have churches in that area today. We have young men and women in Bible school in that area today. And God is moving in that area today. Because when you remember Jesus, people live. And not only that, when you remember Jesus, Jesus also remembers you. <laughs> a year after we first moved in, we had to go out to get a visa renewal. So we went out to Thailand. They have a good hospital. So we decided to go and get our son checked out just to make sure, you know, that, that he wasn't going to die. We do love our son. We want the best for him. But we choose to believe that Jesus loves our kids more than we love them. So we went. Went to the hospital. After a day of exams, a, a very nervous-looking, confused doctor came out with the old x-rays and the new x-rays, and he looked at us and said, I, I don't know what to tell you, but your son has two kidneys now. <laughs> and Ten years later, he still has two kidneys. When you remember Jesus, Jesus remembers you. 
Let me tell you, the best thing you can ever do with your life is to place your hands in the life of Jesus, to break the bread, to take the cup, and say, Jesus, we choose to remember you. But let me tell you, it's not easy. In September this past year, we took our son in for just a, uh, some normal checkups. And I'll never forget, I was in Wisconsin doing a missions fundraiser. And it just finished and was going back and I noticed there was a missed call from my wife and I called my wife back. As soon as she answered the phone, I knew something was wrong. She said, I, I just took Philip into the doctor. He's our middle son. She said, and uh, the doctors are 99% positive he has muscular dystrophy. We went to specialists and the specialist told us, yep, he has muscular dystrophy. And he has a type of muscular dystrophy that uh, the average case is completely immobile by the age of 20. And we've not seen cases live beyond the age of 40. So now you're being told your son is probably going to die before you do. And we went through soul searching for months. Since then, the doctors, they gone through a lot of new testing. They're not sure of diagnosis now. Now they're changing, but uh, still nobody really knows. We're getting ready to go back to India December the 26th. And let me tell you, sometimes it's hard to remember Jesus when you got your own life stuff going on. It's hard to remember. And that's why every day we have to come back to the table. That's why every day we have to take the bread again and say, Jesus, you gave your body, not just for me, not just for my wife, not just for my son, but you gave your body for everybody's wife, for everybody's son, for everybody's daughter, for everybody's father. You gave your life so that all people might be saved, and I choose to join you. I take the bread. God, I choose to join you. You see, there's a warning that Paul gives us about communion. And it's a warning we need to take to heart. He said in verse 27, If anyone eats or drinks in an unworthy manner, they will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You know, usually when we take communion, we start to talk about everybody search your heart. Is there any sin in your life? But remember, this isn't just about me. This isn't just about do I have any personal sin in my life? How do I eat and drink in an unworthy manner? If I live my life in a casual, carefree manner, living for myself, buying for myself, doing for myself, while most of the world has never heard the name of Jesus, I am not eating and drinking in a manner that is worthy of His death. Does that make sense? I mean, if I'm living if, as if everything is done, as if the job is done, as if the task is finished, while everyone around me is dying without Jesus, I'm not eating and drinking in a manner that's worthy of Jesus. I read a story just yesterday about a group of artists in Germany during World War II. And this group of German authors, they, they didn't like Hitler, they didn't like Nazism, they were against everything that he stood for. And yet they were artists and they were just painting pictures. And after a few years of painting pictures while Hitler was taking over the earth, they met together and one of them asked a question. How can we grow roses while the world is being destroyed? How can we grow roses while the world is being destroyed? And they started to ask this question every week. And what they were saying is, we're artists, and we got to be artists, and we do what artists do. But there's something bigger than our artwork. There's something bigger than making the world look beautiful right now. There are people who are dying, and we've got to get involved. We've got to do something. Let me tell you, that's what Jesus is calling us back to every time that we take communion. To remember that the task is not finished. To remember that there are people who have never heard the name of Jesus. People who have never had the opportunity to know that there is salvation and hope. And Jesus is calling us back to a life of dedication to finish the task. 
You know, people often cry out, come back quickly, Lord. I, I want to be with Jesus. But what did Jesus say? That this gospel of the be kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. If you want to see Jesus, then you need to go out and preach the gospel. Don't ever pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, unless you're willing to go quickly and tell all people. What he finally tells us in this is verse 28. He said, let a man examine himself and then eat of the cup, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. How do we examine ourselves? Here's the question I want every one of you to ask yourselves today as we take communion together. Am I doing everything I can do with everything God has given me to make sure everyone has a chance to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That's your question today. Am I doing everything I can do with everything God has given me to make sure everyone has a chance to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That doesn't mean everyone has to go to India, but everyone has to be a part of making sure India hears about Jesus. That doesn't mean that everyone has to go to Africa, but that means everyone has to be a part of making sure all of Africa has the opportunity to know about Jesus. Every one of us, as children of God, bear within us the corporate responsibility of making sure that Jesus Christ is known in all the earth. It is our responsibility as a people to make a covenant together with the Lord. You gave everything to give us life. Now we give everything to make sure everyone has a chance to have this life we have found in you. That's what Jesus is calling us to today. As a body, as a group. You know, today, because of, because of society and because of some of our ways of doing things, we, uh, we take communion in small cups with a small piece of bread. And it's understandable. That's the way we eat in America. That's the way we do in America. But do you realize that the first communion was one big cup, and one big piece of bread? Do you know what that speaks of? It speaks of uh, we're all in this together. You know, when I drink from a little cup, it's just enough for one. The cup that Jesus offers is enough for the whole world to drink. <laughs> the bread that we give is enough for one. The bread that Jesus gives can be broken to feed all people. And all we got to do is keep breaking it. Keep breaking it. Keep offering it. You know, whenever we give communion, we always ask this phrase, has everyone been served? How many of you have ever heard that in a communion service? Has everyone been served? What's the answer to that question? No. For 3,050 people groups around the world today, unengaged, they have never been served. For 2,033 people groups in India today, they have never been served. We are here today as a church, as a body, under the leadership of your leaders, your elders, your pastor, that we are coveting together today to saying this church covenants together with you, Lord, to make sure that every man, every woman, every child from every people group in India and around the world is served today. That's why we're taking communion today, to make a covenant. We will make sure with the last breath that we have, with all the blood in our body, with all the strength that you give us, that everyone around this world is served the bread of life, is served the blood through which there is salvation. We join with you to do everything we can do to make sure everyone has a chance to know Jesus. Oh.